Welcome back, guys. If you've been looking for a new cinema camera, then just forget all of the more expensive competition and go out and pre-order a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K camera. Blackmagic over the past seven years have really disrupted the industry with a slew of cameras that have affected the buying decisions of professionals like myself. I got hooked on Blackmagic cameras in 2012 when I purchased the original 2.5K cinema camera and even though I don't have that camera now, I still to this day do not hesitate to rent it for commercial productions. And the reason why is the pictures just look amazing. So seven years later, will this stack up to the original 2.5K camera as a bit of an industry disruptor. Let's find out. So first thing we should do is have a look at the design of the camera. Out of the box, as soon as you lay your hands on it, you will notice that there is a definitive shift away from the previous cameras, which were made completely out of aluminium, felt very rugged and very sturdy in the hand, to this plasticky polycomposite kind of space age material that is really unapologetically plastic. I mean, listen to this. Nevertheless, while it feels very plastic, it still is very strong and rigid, especially for its extremely light weight. The reduction in weight from the materials used is most likely as what has allowed the engineers to increase the physical size of the camera which for you is a bonus because what it means is the camera gets the proper amount of cooling space engineered into the design around the sensor to keep it cool when shooting very long takes of raw 3 to 1 4K footage. Plus, if you're like me and you've got larger hands, you are not going to feel like your pinky's going to slip off the bottom like a lot of other cameras, which is great because you don't really need to buy the additional battery grip. You can just get around and shoot with a camera like this, pretty low profile and pretty discreetly if you like. On the top of the camera are some very well laid out buttons for record, stills capture, ISO, shutter speed, white balance, three programmable custom function buttons and an on and off switch. On the back of the camera, you'll find Blackmagic Design has incorporated an amazingly nice five inch 1080p touchscreen display that is very responsive and has an excellent picture. Plus some very useful buttons for iris, focus, high frame rate, zoom for focus, menu and playback. I think you'll find the standout here is the high frame rate button, which allows you to switch seamlessly between your project frame rate and off-speed shooting frame rates of your choice, very fast and very easily. On the far right is a media door where inside you will find two card slots, one for an SD card and the other for a CFast 2 card. But the Pocket 4K camera's recording options don't stop here. You can always grab inexpensive off-the-shelf USB-C type drives like this SSD T5 by Samsung, which is 500 gig, which directly connects via the USB-C port into the operator side of the camera here, where you will find a 3.5 millimeter microphone input and headphone jack, full-size HDMI, which you would have to agree is a godsend considering how many micro HDMI cables we have all broken on mirrorless and DSLR cameras. The camera also has a 12 volt, two pin Limo external power connection and a mini XLR, which is great because this means that you can easily add to the camera and expand its production capabilities. For me, the best part of the expandability of the camera is being able to use these off the shelf drives. I went with the T5 500 gig version because it only costs 70 US dollars. And for this reason, I can never see myself using CFast cards, which are incredibly expensive and only offer the benefit of being able to shoot raw internally in the camera. The Samsung T5 is super lightweight. So if the camera needs to go on a gimbal, the external drive will not cause any weight problems. All in all, whichever decision you choose to go with with your recording media, 
The best thing is, is that black magic design gives you the choice, which currently a lot of other manufacturers do not. Okay, now that we've looked at the outside of the camera, we really need to get down into the nitty gritty and see if the camera is all hype or whether it can actually deliver. So, does this camera stack up where it counts the most? The sensor. There is a lot of discussion at the moment on whether the Micro Four Thirds system is going to die with the current trend of full frame cameras on the market. But here's the thing, the Pocket 4K has a slightly larger than Micro Four Thirds sensor at 18.96x10 millimeters, meaning it sports a full size Four Thirds sensor with a 1.89 crop factor in relation to full frame, rather than the traditional two times crop factor of Micro Four Thirds systems like the Panasonic GH series. The dual native ISO is interesting and through my testing, which you can see here, when recording a black screen to reveal the noise floor and patterning, you can see that the ISO is fairly clean until you get to around 800 ISO and above. There, the noise level and pattern is fairly undesirable and until you hit the secondary native ISO bracket at around 1250, where you can see that it completely eliminates the noise and until a much, much higher ISO, well in excess of 3200 ISO. At the limits of the Pocket 4K's ISO range, the camera behaves exactly like every other digital cinema camera on the market. Being once you really start to push that sensor, the footage becomes unusable unless it's done as a creative decision. So while this is a valid test, it kind of also is an invalid test because all digital CMOS sensors behave in exactly the same way. And that includes Sony for the fanboys. For the most part, my test revealed that at 1600 and 3200 ISOs, the results are very clean, especially for four thirds systems and much smaller sensors. The camera is advertised as having 13 stops of dynamic range, which is pretty impressive considering the size of the sensor and the footage doesn't seem to suffer from the harsh clips in the highlights as previous cameras that Blackmagic Design has released. It is pretty damn impressive. That means you no longer have to plan your shooting around this as a DOP. But in the advent that you do get an exposure wrong, you can always take it into Resolve, which comes for free with the camera, click that recover highlight button and you should get most of it back unless you have made a critical error. In my opinion, this could be a huge win for documentary shooters as you are getting a slightly larger sensor than Micro Four Thirds while still having a relatively usable depth of field, great low light capabilities, especially coupled with the right speed booster to compensate for challenging lighting conditions that are always constantly changing with no time for lighting changes or lighting at all. When speed boosted, this camera, like many cameras in this competitive space, can yield very pleasing results. There are two main choices of speed booster on the market that you can choose from. The Metabones, which is super expensive and yields far sharper images, or the Viltrox EF to M2 adapter, which is far more budget friendly at one quarter of the price and has arguably more pleasing softness to the image, which the four thirds system needs to look not so video and appear a little bit more cinematic. The Pocket 4K camera also boasts slow motion capabilities of 60 frames per second in 4K RAW or 120 frames per second in a windowed HD in either 3 to 1 RAW or ProRes HQ. While some people will see the windowed sensor as a loss in quality, compared to more expensive cameras on the market, this is totally usable slow motion footage. These frames can also be recorded internally or externally in the best codecs and lowest compressions, which is simply excellent. 
And for those of you who haven't used Bra yet as a recording format, you no longer require huge computing horsepower in post-production to manipulate the files. I know a lot of you guys out there are like me and you like to shoot handheld, but the base configuration of this camera really isn't conducive to that type of work and really does need additional money spent to make it usable. If you're a camera operator, you will know that this is not an effective way to shoot. Neither is using the highly reflective screen on the back. So like many major brands of video cameras, an onboard monitor or EVF is essential. As bad as the camera is to use outdoors because of the screen's reflectivity, the screen does house one of the best features that this tiny little pocket rocket of a camera has to offer, which is its menu system. This is something that Blackmagic Design has just got right from the very beginning. The GUI is an absolute delight to use, especially if you're coming from Sony. The menus are so simple and easy to navigate that you don't even need to read the owner's manual to understand them. What you will get from Blackmagic Design's Pocket 4K interface is a simple to learn, snappy and intuitive experience that doesn't feel laggy or complicated at all. That's what we all want, ease of use. Unfortunately though, as good as the menu is, not everything in the usability is roses and candy as the camera does consume a lot of batteries, especially if you're going the LPE6 route. And if you're coming from Canon and bringing your older batteries, you may find that some of them won't even power the camera for very long as the pocket camera requires a minimum of 6.2 volts just to operate. You can always buy a USB-C power bank to recharge your LPE6 batteries, but you will not be able to run the camera at the same time or from the USB-C connection as it is only rated to five volts of power. Some quick and simple solutions are to use the house power supply via the two pin limo connector, a VLUC or Anton Bauer battery via a DTAP to two pin limo adapter. Without creating some DIY battery hack, the last solution is the best for the camera, especially if you want to turn the camera into more of a production build. I know that VLOCs can get expensive. I know that they're not cheap but they are definitely the best investment because they will work with all of your cameras that you potentially might buy later after this camera. They're an industry standard. If you do just want to stick with the smallest, most compact solution, you can always buy the newer LPE6N batteries like this one, which you can use in the camera. And these batteries will also show you the runtime left in the camera to prevent accidental power downs during takes, which sucks, especially if it's a critical performance moment. This is why I'm really glad that Blackmagic Design has put a lot of effort into fixing the audio preamps in the camera, because audio is something that has, especially in the original cameras was really, it really seemed like an afterthought. Finally, Blackmagic has got it right from the internal mics to the connectivity of the external microphones via the mini XLR and 3.5 mic jacks. Effectively, you can run two separate channels of audio and have them record very, very clean to camera. You can also record audio while shooting slow motion, which again is great for doco shooters who just need to flip that switch and spray off a few high speed shots and still retain the ability to capture audio at the same time. All in all, the Pocket 4K has so many good features, guys, that only a much longer video or a series of videos coming up will do it justice. All in all, the points I've touched on are just really skimming the surface of what the camera is capable of and what you can do with it and how amazing you can make the footage look. I mean, look, guys, for 1300 US dollars, you can't go wrong. You now don't need to move up to something more expensive to achieve cinematic videos. With that being said, I understand the true cost of the camera is much higher. It is, because once you start rigging it out with an EVF, a monitor, batteries, battery solution, media, cables, connections, rigs, hand grips, handlebars, 
just like every other camera on the market, RED, Sony, ARRI, uh, even Canon, your starting price point will be much higher. The beauty of this camera is that its starting point is so low, so by the time you buy all those other accessories, like I just mentioned, and you've rigged out the camera, you've still spent less money. And if there comes a time where you wanna move on to a much larger system, like a RED, a Canon, an ARRI, or a Sony, you can always take the majority of those accessories and use them with the other camera systems. That's a big plus. The money that you invest in this isn't dead money, but look, if you're just starting out and you can't afford all the additional stuff, the reality is, is that you don't need it. The camera like this shoots amazing pictures. All of the animations and all of the video and all of the cutaways that you've seen in this video have been done with this camera, except for this main shot here, which has been shot with a 5D Mark II. Bottom line is, if you're a budding DOP or a director and you're looking to shoot short films, narrative content, uh, vlogs, uh, YouTube videos, you want to get into the commercial world, shoot um, TVCs, and don't rule out uh, feature films yet guys because I'm pretty sure that this camera will get certified for Netflix there's there's just no barrier to entry anymore into the market with this camera except for one thing the shipping date okay guys that's it from me if you've got one of these cameras send me some links to some of your footage and if you don't have one of these cameras go rent one and see if the camera actually is good for the way you film and if it is, send me some links to the footage and I will see you in the next one, guys. Bye for now.